Hello, happy Halloween. Welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Morose, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Dr. Mark Brigham will be speaking about goat suckers, the enigma of feathered bats. Every month, PCAP asks someone to present either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in the Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. And I would like to note that on November 21st, Dr. Alicia Burzens from the University of Saskatchewan will be talking about prairie pond abundance and breeding success of tree swallows. On December 18th, Andrew Jakes will be speaking about pronghorn in the northern end of their range. Uh, information about these webinars is available on the PCAP website and you can register for free and again you can watch from any location. I would like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our gold sponsors, Crescent Point Energy, SAS Power, Sask Energy, and Wildlife Habitat Canada. Our supporting sponsor, Eco-Friendly Sask, as well as Environment and Climate Change Canada. In-kind support for today's presentation has been given by uh, Dr. Mark Brigham and the University of Regina. Uh, a reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the question section at, of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation, and then questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Now, a bit about our presenter. Mark Brigham is a professor at the University uh, of Regina, the Department of Biology. He and his students are addressing questions about how bats and night jars use torpor and hibernation to save energy during periods with low food availability. He also has students studying the ecology of endangered birds and mammals to understand the reasons for and reverse population declines. He is one of two co-editors of the Canadian Journal of Zoology. Dr. Brigham received the University of Regina Alumni Awards for Public Service for teaching and for graduate student mentoring. Mark teaches introductory biology, ecology, vertebrate biology, and animal behavior. In 2006, he received the Garrett S. Miller Jr. Award from the North American Symposium on Bat, Researching, Bat Research for outstanding lifetime service and contributions to chiropractic biology. Aside from my his formal teaching duties, Mark is a strong proponent of bringing science and his research to the public. He regularly gives bat talks um, about 10 to 20 times per year to school groups, naturalist organizations, and service clubs. And partly for this, he was awarded the 2008 Joseph Grinnell Award by the American Society of Mnemologists for long-term contributions to education about mnemology. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mark. All right, thank you, Caitlin. So uh, this is new for me, um, not having an audience in front of me, and, and I hope uh, all enjoy. And I would reiterate what Caitlin says, that if you have uh, any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, ask them to me uh, through the webinar system. But I will also um, feel free to contact me directly and uh, uh, if you don't have a chance to write down my email address, which is the best way to do that, um, I'm pretty easy to find via the University of Regina's uh, website. Uh, and if you just go to biology and uh, faculty members, I'm pretty evident there. And uh, I would happily answer your questions um, because the animals that I'm going to talk about tonight tend to generate a great deal of questions. So with that, a little bit about what I'm going to say. Um, I'm going to explain many of the words in the title, um, but given that it is October 30th and we're on the eve of the most dreaded day in the calendar for uh, bats, one of my favorite animals, um, we need to say a little bit about them, and which is hopefully going to explain why I call these other things feathered bats. I'll then explain a little bit about what goat suckers are, who they are, um, and then uh, sort of the last sections will be about uh, some of the work that we've done about how these cool animals deal with cold, also how they deal with heat, which is equally impressive, and, and then at the end uh, a little bit about 
status and conservation, which is something we have to think about, um, unfortunately, for many animals. Um, but I'm going to end up telling you a good news story, um, which I think is good. So I hate this day that's coming um, because I have to do a whole lot of explaining about bats to lots of people. Uh, they certainly are an animal. Um, like snakes, like spiders, like sharks, that elicits great curiosity amongst people and unfortunately a good deal of fear. And I'm going to start by saying I particularly hate a person named Bram Stoker. And for those of you who don't recognize that name, uh, he is the person who wrote uh, the book called Dracula uh, at the turn of the 19th century, so 120 years ago or so. Uh, I would highly recommend that you read the book. It's actually very, very good. He's an extraordinarily good writer. But he took this cool legend about a character named Dracula and put bats in it. So bats were not associated with Dracula until Bram Stoker put them together to make for a better story. So read the story, but recognize that in fact, bats have nothing to do with the Dracula legend, which comes from Transylvania and is about 600 years old. Okay? So uh, they are distinctly different, and Mr. Stoker owes a lot of us bat biologists a, a good deal of apology. So what makes bats special? They are mammals. So there's approximately 5,000 different species of mammals currently alive in the world. Mammals are those animals that uh, have fur. No other animals have fur. And they feed their offspring milk. No other animals do that in the same way. They're called mammals because they have mammary glands where that milk is produced. Okay. Of the 5,000 mammals, as of last week, there are 1,411 of them were bats. So there are 1,411 different species of bats. And experts on the sort of taxonomy or the identification of bats submit that within six to eight years, we will hit the 1,500 species mark because they're so poorly studied in many parts of the world. So approximately one in four mammal is a bat. So the diversity of them is very high, and they represent a, a big majority or a, a great number of the different species of mammals. Now, this one that's in this picture is actually a pretty special one. Um, here's a close-up of his face. This is the vampire bat. There are three species of vampire bats. They don't live in Transylvania, which, as I said, is in Europe. These animals all live in Central and South America. And they were discovered, at least the common vampire species, which is the most common one of the three, by a biologist named Charles Darwin, which is probably a name quite familiar to most of you. Um, and they were discovered in the 1830s when he was sailing around the world on the Beagle. Everything most people think they know about vampires, vampire bats in particular, is in fact incorrect most of the time. So these animals are very small, uh, they only weigh about 40 grams, which is about six loonies in your hand, so they're not very big. Um, they do not suck blood. They make a slit in the skin of a sleeping animal with those razor-sharp front teeth that you can see, and they lick up the blood. They take about a tablespoon. They really don't like blood from humans because, in most instances, ours is too salty for their tastes. They will eat it if necessary, but they much prefer horse, cow, and chicken blood. And because we have put many more horses, cows, and chickens into South and Central America, these bats have become much more common. Perhaps the most interesting fact about them, from my point of view, is that they are one of the few animals that will actively share food with non-relatives. A vampire bat will starve to death if it doesn't get a meal every 48 hours. And they live together in groups in a hollow tree. And if they don't get a meal, they will actively beg from other members of the colony. And frequently, other members of the colony will regurgitate blood and feed them and keep them going. They seem to do this reciprocally, depending on the success rate of various individuals. Um, but I think it's something that we as humans could learn a lot from. So they will actively share food. So a particularly important creature to know a little bit about um, on the eve of Halloween. 
I want to reiterate that bats are not big. So a common myth surrounding them is that they are large. So in North America, the biggest bat would be vampire bat sized, 40 grams, six loonies in your hand. Most bats are very, very small. So this is a, in the picture, a rather common species in Western North America called the Western small-footed bat. The animal in my hand is adult. It's not gonna get any bigger. And it's actually a pregnant female. So she's about as plump as she's gonna be in her entire life. And you can tell from the size, she's small. To put her mass in perspective, this animal weighs about four grams, which is marginally heavier than a Canadian nickel, okay? Smallest bat in the world weighs two grams, which is marginally more than a Canadian dime. Most bats are small. More than half of the world species would be as small or smaller than a vampire. Another common myth surrounding bats is illustrated by this picture, and I'm afraid I have to be a bit sexist here because it's females that tend to be more worried about this than males, and that is that bats are going to fly in their hair. The common uh, explanation for this is that the animal is trying to make a nest in their hair, and of course nesting really is more commonly associated with birds, not bats, um, uh, so they don't make nests per se, and uh, I know from firsthand experience, if I put a bat in the curliest of hair, um, the outcome is very quick, and that is the bat is flying in one direction, probably very scared, and the person whose hair I put it in would be running in the opposite direction, very scared. Bats just don't fly in your hair. Um, in my opinion, this myth got started because most insects in the summertime actually are attracted to the heat that we lose from our heads. And what the bats are doing by flying close to your head is simply taking advantage of prey that are attracted to the heat that you're losing. So you can think of yourself as McDonald's on wheels, quite frankly. They don't care about your hair. They're just trying to get an easy meal. This is a picture of a bat called a, an epauletted flying fox. The flying fox name is pretty obvious because it looks like a dog. Um, it's found in southern parts of Africa. And this illustrates uh, for me very well the myth um, that I was exposed to when I was young. And that is my father used to always tell me when I couldn't find something that I was blind as a bat. It's an expression that's very commonly used, but it's totally incorrect. There is no such thing, unless there's been an accident, of a bat that is blind. All of them can see, and in the case of this animal, it uses vision alone to fly around on the darkest of nights with no moon, lots of cloud, and sees better than many owls do. So it has extraordinary vision. Now, most bats are known for a different system of orientation. So this animal is called the little brown bat. Um, one of the most common species until very recently in all of North America. It's found over much of Saskatchewan. Um, and it uses, as do most insect-eating bats the world over, probably eight or 900 of the 1,400 species, it uses something called echolocation to find its way around and to find food. Quite literally what that means is that these animals are flying through the air, screaming, high frequency or high pitch sounds um, about uh, up to 100, even 200 times per second, and they listen for the echoes from surfaces, from trees, and from insects that they're trying to capture. This explains why almost all pictures of bats show them with their mouths open. That's because they're screaming. They have to, to echolocate, uh, to produce those high intensity sounds. And when I say high intensity, I really do mean very high intensity. This animal, which weighs seven grams, which is the same as a loony, can make sounds considerably more intense than the smoke detector um, down your hallway outside your bedroom door. So if we could hear them, and we can't because the frequency that they use is too high, it would hurt our ears. That's how loud they are. So echolocation, very, very cool system, uh, and bats use it remarkably well. But if you look closely, this animal has a set of eyes. We know they're functional. The one thing as scientists we don't understand is what they use that information for. 
Most people think that bats are closely related to rodents, mice in particular, and this picture gives the impression that this is just a flying little rodent. Believe it or not, this is the same species of bat that I showed in the previous picture. This is a little brown bat, caught it in Moose Mountain Provincial Park. It happened to be born with no pigment in its skin. This is called albinism, or being an albino. Can happen to all kinds of mammals and birds and all sorts of things. The female in this picture was pregnant when I caught her, seemed to be doing perfectly well, even though she was totally white. Notice the pink eyes. Point being, bats are not just flying mice. So if you speak other languages like German or French, the word for bat in those languages gives the impression um, that bats are nothing more than flying mice. Um, nothing could be farther from the truth. Amongst mammals, bats are only distantly related to rodents. They're probably thought of better as miniature flying grizzly bears than rodents. Perhaps the best word that I know for bat in a language other than English is the Cree word for bat, which is apocoasis, and that roughly translated means cousin of bird. And I think that's a much better way to think of them because they both share the ability to fly. So those are a few myths, etc., about bats. Um, I'll refer back to some of those things um, when I talk about uh, this goat sucker thing um, that was the title of the talk. So to begin then, what is a goat sucker or night jar anyway? Those two words refer to a group of birds, and those two words are basically interchangeable. Goat sucker is probably used more commonly in North America, whereas night jar is more commonly used in Europe. I like go goat sucker for shock value. Night jar is better uh, as terms of a descriptor, and what it refers to is that they make night jarring sounds. So almost all of them look something like this. They have big eyes. They can see very, very well. They are nocturnal for the most part, like bats. Some are what we would call crepuscular, which means active at dawn and dusk. They tend to have little wee beaks that you can see, and they tend to have feathers or plumage that is very cryptic, very camouflaged. They're very hard to find, which means they're remarkably understudied. Currently, they're found on every continent but Antarctica. Um, they were, till about 700 years ago, found on New Zealand. They don't occur there anymore. But throughout the rest of the world, they are found almost everywhere. And without a high degree of knowledge, the picture that you see could be on any continent. So they look remarkably similar um, in many places. There's probably on the order of about 125 or so species worldwide. So they're not as diverse as bats, but they're found everywhere like bats. That little beak actually can open up into a very large mouth. Think of it like an insect sweep net. The vast majority of night jars um, eat nothing but flying insects, um, and they catch them in this really large mouth. No birds that are living today have teeth, so what they do is they swallow the insect and it's ground up in, in their muscular stomach. My hands give an idea of how big this animal is. Uh, this one in, uh, weighs about 70 grams, or 10 loonies in your hand. The smallest night jars in the world are on the order of 40. So relative to bats, um, they are considerably bigger. Some of them get to be several hundred grams in size. So where did this goat sucker idea come from? This is a piece of art uh, that I came across um, that is very, very old. And it shows various nocturnal animals, including this bird in the lower left corner, which is sucking at the teat of a goat. So the myth started in Europe. And the idea was that e these animals snuck down from the hills at night and suckled livestock. Like many of the myths surrounding bats, it is a myth. It's not true. A, a nightjar or goat sucker wouldn't know what to do with a mouthful of milk if it found its way into a situation where that happened. Likely what they were doing is that they would fly down to where livestock were penned for the evening and as the livestock moved around they would stir up insects which these birds would fly up after and eat. 
but they certainly weren't um, suckling them. However, what's cool is that the scientific name of this group is called the Caprimulgidae, which directly translated from Latin is goat sucker. So scientists have used this word to describe the group um, from a scientific perspective. And there is a group in Australia called the Owlet Nightjars, whose uh, genus name, Agapheles, is Greek for goat sucker. <clears throat> So it's been used in all sorts of places, but in that sense, it's good for its shock value, but it's not really descriptive of what they do. Okay, so this gives a better view of uh, another species it's called the fiery neck nightjar, one of my favorites, lives in southern Africa. So it shows the big eyes very, very well, shows the, the mottled plumage. This particular species is well named because it has russet or rusty feathers uh, around its neck, um, which give it the name. The other thing that you can see from this photograph quite clearly that most night jars have is, are those bristle-like feathers that come off on either side of the mouth. They're technically called rictal bristles, uh, and they're an awful lot like whiskers. There hasn't been a lot of work done on them, but the idea is that they help actually steer insects into the bird's mouth when it opens that great big wide mouth. The reason why this species is one of my favorites is because of the night jarring call that it gives. In parts of Southern Africa, it's also known as the litany bird because its call sounds like, and based on the syllables, it really does, good Lord deliver us good Lord deliver us, good Lord deliver us, which it repeats over and over and over many hundreds of times per night. So other species that people might be familiar with, uh, this is a bird called a whippoorwill, which is found in many parts of Eastern North America. If you're listening in in Saskatchewan and live near Yorkton, it, there's a small area in that part of Saskatchewan where this species has been recorded, making Saskatchewan special because we are the only province in Canada where there are three different species of nightjar known to occur. So whippoorwills, a more eastern forest species, um, a really uh, sort of cool bird with a sound that's sort of akin to a loon in the summertime, they say their name, and again, hundreds of times. One of my colleagues sat up all night once and counted, and he counted an individual make about 16,000 whippoorwills over the course of a single night. This is the one that I started to study first, and still one of my favorites. This is the Western version of the whippoorwill, and it is called the poor will in specifically the common poor will. So it has one less syllable to its call than the whippoorwill does, and it's a little smaller. So it weighs about 50 grams and is found in many arid areas in Western North America. In Saskatchewan, it has been found in the Cypress Hills quite frequently, the Great Sand Hills, and sort of the drier arid parts as you go west. It's very common in the Okanagan Valley of British Columbia. Now, the reason I was attracted to these animals is in large part due to this photograph, which appeared in a 1951 issue of National Geographic. The author of the article is the man in the leather jacket. His name was Edmund Yeager, and the arrow points to a hole in a rock. And he, by happenstance, discovered that there was a poor will in the hole in that rock. What they did is they taped a couple of hairs over the entrance to that hole, came back a week or so later, and the hairs were undisturbed and the bird was still in the hole. And that was the basis for suggesting that poor wills hibernate. So hibernation is something that many mammals are well known for. Many, many species of bats hibernate. So it's instead of migrating, like most birds do, flying to warmer climates for the winter, which is why we call many Canadians at this time of the year snowbirds, many bats and perhaps this poor will hibernate for the winter, which means you stay put and you live off the reserves that you have um, for the winter. Okay. So hibernation is an instance where the animal reduces its metabolism, 
and um, lives off usually the fat that it has stored on its body. So it reduces its heart rate, it reduces its breathing rate, and um, it often leads to a reduction in its body temperature, and that means it can live for extended periods of time um, without eating. So here is a picture of a common poor will in the Okanagan Valley of British Columbia during the summertime. Uh, this picture is uh, now nearly 30 years old. So the bird's head is pointing towards the upper left part of uh, the picture. Its tail is along the stick at the bottom. The camera is probably less than half a meter from the bird, um, and it is in what we often call torpor. So when you hibernate, you use bouts of torpor, usually extend for a number of days at a time. Animals can also use torpor over shorter periods of time. Many bats, and it turns out these birds can use torpor um, for 12 or 15 hours at a time. We often refer to it as daily torpor. So after I took the picture, I picked up this bird. It was incapable of flying, and its body temperature was somewhere around four degrees Celsius. So birds normally have a body temperature just like mammals, 37, 38, somewhere in that region. And this animal had to let its body temperature fall, its heart rate fall, and was saving energy on a cold Okanagan morning um, in the summertime. A student of mine named Chris Woods ex uh, explored poor Will's behavior further and he worked in Arizona in the wintertime to see whether hibernation really did happen. Could we collect real sort of more sort of stringent data than, than Jaeger found and show that they were hibernating? To cut to the chase, Chris found that they could. And in this particular instance, here you have a poor will uh, with its head jammed into a whole bunch of prickly pear cactus. Now, the one thing this photograph doesn't show is the fact that all of the birds that we found doing this always faced southwest. That's important because southwest is the direction that you get warm afternoon sun in deserts, and that afternoon sun seems to be very important for these animals. So I'm going to show a few graphs tonight. Um, the point is to show that we have real data to, to support some of the contentions I'm going to make. I'll try to explain the graphs as best as I can, but hopefully in most of these cases, they're not really meant to be particularly complicated. But if you have questions, again, feel free to get in touch. So what we have shown here is the calendar year on the bottom of the graph. So what these birds over the, do over the course of the year. And on the vertical axis where it says percentage of nights, reflects the number of nights that poor wills that Chris had caught and put a little device on that allowed us to tell what the bird's temperature was, how often they used torpor, that is they let their body temperature fall, that's the hatch bars, and you notice that basically in November, December, January, February, and March, birds used torpor almost every single night, and then the black bars reflect those uh, nights where the bird never actually moved at all. So they were torpid at, for at least some of the night, almost all the time, but in November, or sorry, December, January, and February, 70 to 80 percent of nights, they never moved at all. They never fed, they never went out. So that is getting close to what we would call hibernation. So here's a trace of what a bird looked like on most days. So on the bottom axis, you have from zero, zero, which is midnight, all the way to the next midnight. So it shows an average cycle during a 24 hour period. On the vertical axis, you have temperature, okay? Now the light line, which tends to be below the dark line most places, is the air temperature. So it went from about five degrees through the night, then increased to nearly 20, this is near Tucson in Arizona. And then as the sun set, the temperature fell and it got cold again. So the black triangle pointing up is sunrise. The black triangle pointing down is sunset. The thick black line represents the temperature of the poor will. So what the bird was doing at that point. So what you'll notice is that at midnight on the left side of the graph, the bird's temperature was 10 degrees Celsius, very cold. But as that sun 
uh, started to warm up in the morning, the bird's temperature increased. So it took advantage, we think, of the sun to help it get warmer through the afternoon. But then as the sun set, it got cool, the bird let its body temperature fall again and went back into torpor. So this concurrent rise in temperature of the air and rise in temperature of the animal, we refer to as passive rewarming. So the animal is able to use the sun to help get it warm. But the one thing that this doesn't really show was the fact that in all of these cases, 103 different days when Chris did this with birds that were carrying transmitters, this animal didn't move. So it never went out to feed. Uh, it, it stayed in the same place day after day, but each day its temperature got increased. So Chris had the great idea, let's deprive it of sun and see what it does. So he deployed these really high tech pieces of equipment, pieces of plywood, to shade roosting poor wills to see how they coped. Interestingly, they didn't wake up and fly away. They coped and here's what happened. The body temperature went up a little bit during the daytime, concurrent with the air temperature, but they didn't get nearly as warm as the unshaded birds. So remember I said they roosted in prickly pear facing southwest. There appears to be a real reason for this. These birds do this so that every afternoon normally they get sun and can get warmer and fly away if they want to. If you shade them, they're not able to get nearly as warm. Once in a while, however, what's really cool is that even when they're shaded, they will increase their body temperature, which means they can do it without the sun. This is something that mammals that hibernate do quite frequently, is that they arouse by themselves. Mammals use a tissue called brown fat, which enables them to produce lots of heat. How these birds do it, we really don't know. We do know that they don't have brown fat, um, so there's some other mechanism. So if you put it all together and look at what a poor will does over a long period of time, this is a trace for a single individual from the 20th of December, at the bottom left of the graph, all the way to the 3rd of February on the right hand side of the graph. So a period of six weeks or so, this individual never moved in that whole period of time. It was shaded for the whole period of time, but about every five or six days, for reasons that we don't know, it aroused and got its body temperature quite warm and then went right back into hibernation style torpor. What's fascinating for me is that when mammals hibernate, they also arouse at intervals of about a week or two. Um, so they do precisely the same thing. They don't stay cold for weeks and weeks at a time. We don't know why mammals do it, and we certainly don't know why the poor will does it. So how do you cope with a, a cold winter um, when there's not many insects around? Well, rather than migrating to a place that's really warm, this particular bird, and for the time being, it is the only bird in the world that we know that can do this, you can hibernate for the winter. Makes them very similar to lots of insect eating bats. So that brings me to meeting up with this character. His name is Andrew McKechnie. He's a professor at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. And he's very interested on the impacts of climate change, particularly on birds, although I'm trying to get him interested in bats as well. And he has started a research group that's known as the Hot Birds Group. And that is the idea being, how do birds cope with climate change? South Africa is a country that, like the Canadian Arctic, um, because it's really hot, um, they are having and going to have serious issues with heat as a problem for animals um, as climate change becomes more and more of an issue. Um, and his uh, group is very keen on understanding how birds cope with this heat. Um, we're good colleagues and, of course, how do night jars cope with heat? And it would appear at the outset that they're every bit as good at coping with heat as they are at coping with cold. So we uh, collectively co-supervised a student named Ryan O'Connor, who's finished his PhD, now Dr. O'Connor, who studied a couple of night jars, freckled night jars and rufous cheek night jars. Again, notice that they look very, very similar. In this case, they're both about 60 or 70 grams. They roost on the ground, um, very hard to see. 
Now, these two graphs are a little bit more complicated, but bear with me. So there's one graph for each species, and what you can take from this is the shapes of the two graphs look remarkably similar. So what Ryan did is he caught individuals of both of these species, and he brought them into ca captivity for a couple of days, put them in a machine that measures how much uh, humidity they put into the air and how much oxygen they're using. What that allows us to do is measure their me metabolic rate, so how they're using energy, and from the water into the air, we can measure how much water they're evaporating to keep cool. Those numbers along the bottom axis from 10 to 55 represent the temperatures in this chamber that we exposed these animals to. And it is not a typo, we could expose these birds to 55 degrees Celsius. The left hand or vertical axis, TEWL, means total evaporative water loss in grams per hour. So what that means is how much water these birds are effectively panting out to keep their body temperature cool when they're exposed to these hot temperatures. So in both cases, they really didn't evaporate much water until about 40 degrees Celsius, but from 40 to 55, the amount that they evaporated went up very, very substantially. So at 55 degrees, these animals were evaporating about two grams of water per hour that they were exposed to those temperatures, okay? I'm happy to tell you that no birds were hurt in this experiment, and a couple of days later, they were released back where we caught them. The other thing Ryan did was to measure the actual temperatures that real birds would be exposed to. So he used these models that were made of plastic with thermometers inside and set them out in places where he found these birds roosting. So he, he could measure then air temperature as well as something called operative temperature, which is what the animal is actually exposed to. So all of you probably know if you like to suntan and you lay out in the sun, you get a whole lot warmer than the actual air temperature because of the sun heating you up. So you're actually exposed to much higher temperatures than um, the air temperature itself. So one of the locations that he found is at the end of the arrow, and this is where um, one of these freckled night jars actually had a nest. So when the bird was finished nesting, he put his models at the exact same place where the bird was. And this is what he found. So again, we have a graph that shows time of day from midnight all the way to midnight, a 24 hour cycle. Um, the models were deployed for a number of days, so you get an average here. And temperature is on the vertical axis as before. You'll notice it goes from 15 degrees up to 55. The light gray line is the air temperature that was the average over the days that he put the model out. The dotted line is what you would expect to be the temperature of the bird if it was staying warm all the time. So that's about the normal body temperature of a freckled night jar. The black line is what the models told us was the environmental temperature that a bird would have been exposed to given the air temperature and the sunshine that it was exposed to. So you notice that environmental temperature is way higher than actual air temperature. Now if you combine that environmental temperature with how much water we know these birds evaporate given the temperatures to which they were exposed in, in the um, lab setting, this graph tells a remarkable story. So again, the light gray line at the bottom is how much water the bird would evaporate if it was really and truly only exposed to air temperature, but we know it's not. We know it's exposed to environmental temperature, and that amount of water is represented by the black line. And in summary, if you go up to the very top, and it says T-E-E-W-L. So that means the evaporative water loss by a bird over the course of a day exposed to this environmental temperature. We calculate that one of these birds would have to evaporate 11 plus grams of water 
or nearly 20% of its body, body mass in order to keep itself cool over the course of a single day. And I can tell you they don't get up and fly in the daytime to drink. So it, all this water has to be on board when they start the day. So for me, weighing some, somewhere north of 200 pounds, it would mean that I would have to get rid of 40 pounds of water in one day to be as good at evaporating water as these birds are. Take home message, wow, can they ever cope with heat really, really well. So the final part of my talk then is gonna concern perhaps the most common um, night jar or, uh, in North America. Many of you may have seen this roosting on fence posts around the prairies. It's called a common night hawk. So, it's sort of a subgroup within the goat suckers. It's not really a night jar because it doesn't really make the same sort of night jarring sounds as a whippoorwill or a poor will or a fiery neck night jar. And it also doesn't have the real rictal bristles like the other do, but it's got the same cryptic plumage, the same big eyes. Now, many people misinterpret what they do because of their name. So the hawk in Nighthawk doesn't mean hawk like a Swainson's hawk or a red-tailed hawk. So it's not a, a carnivore in that sense. It hawks for insects from flight, much like a swallow does. So it's, it's like a big swallow. The animal weighs about 70 grams. Its wingspan, probably about 70 centimeters. So uh, it looks like a small gull in the distance to some people, but it hawks for insects. Okay, a piece of artwork showing it using street lights um, to enable it to catch insects. Fairly fast flying, but also highly maneuverable, and many people don't even notice um, that they're around. In late summer, if you happen to go to a Rough Rider game, look up if the game is boring in the lights, and you will often see these birds hunting insects in the lights at night. Okay, so they're widely distributed in North America. They go into the, uh, the territories um, and they migrate. Um, they're amongst one of the longer distance migrants, we think as far as Argentina, depending on individuals. So they are found over much of Canada and almost all of the United States. Very distinctive when they're in flight, the white wing bars that sort of cross their elbows uh, make them very easy to identify. Um, although when they sit on the ground, they fold those wings in and they then become, like other night jars, very difficult to find. Often fly very erratically when they're chasing insects. The other thing that makes these a little different is that they're active principally what we call crepuscularly. So that's they fly around after food at uh, dusk and then they fly around again at dawn. They're not active in the middle of the night. They don't tend to be very active in the daytime. Um, so they're typically found roosting like this in a variety of situations. Unlike most birds who perch across the branch, nighthawks sit the same way that the branch is going and they have tiny little feet like other members of the group. So they're really sitting more on their chests than they are sitting on their feet. So uh, split rail fence is a good place. They'll sit on rocks, they'll sit on the ground, um, they will sit on branches as well. Like most night jars, nighthawk nesting is, is uh, similar and consistent. They don't build a nest per se, they lay their eggs directly on the ground. And worldwide, um, the vast majority of, of night jars and nighthawks lay one or two eggs. There's a couple of species that lay four, um, but one or two would be most common. Um, and then when the bird sits on them, they're of course not evident at all. Um, nighthawk eggs are sort of slightly modeled, but they'd be very easy to see if the bird was not sitting on them. They become much more difficult to find when the bird is. So out hatch a couple of very, very fluffy chicks that don't look particularly attractive, um, but within about three weeks they grow up and become um, nighthawk looking. Uh, I'm quite like this picture. It was taken in the Cypress Hills um, near the conglomerate cliffs, and this is uh, because of a radio transmitter. We know this is dad sitting on a road um, with his two chicks, which is very, very recently fledged. So here's the conservation bit. So so most of you hopefully be familiar with uh, the 
CASIWIC, which is a national committee which decides on the status of wildlife in Canada. These are data from something called breeding bird surveys, which are done all over North America. Every one of those sort of little dots on the map of North America represents a route that volunteers go out and survey in the summertime um, with a strict set of guidelines. So they drive along roads, stop for certain periods of time and listen and identify all the birds that they hear. Based on the data that we have, you get the graph on the right hand side, which is the number of nighthawks that were heard along <clears throat> all these BBS routes in Canada which led to grave concern that in fact nighthawk numbers had gone down dramatically. This in part led Kasiewicz to decide that nighthawks should be de designated as a threatened species. So this happened in 2007. These are the other categories that Kasiewicz can apply to various species. Um, the one that it doesn't show is not concerned or not of concern. Um, that's where we want all species. But nighthawks were considered threatened, which is one step below endangered, um, which is really, really critical. Um, so there was a great amount of concern that these birds were declining um, in uh, rapidly and that we needed to learn more about them to determine why. Now one problem with the breeding bird survey is that it happens at dawn but after sunrise. So the graph on the left the pink box shows when the breeding bird survey takes place. The black bars that are nice and high shows subsequently what we've learned about when nighthawks make sound that would allow them to be de de detected by the breeding bird survey. So what this really means is the breeding bird survey isn't particularly well suited to detecting nighthawks. And therefore maybe part of our problem was we weren't surveying for them at the right time, which led the young lady in the bottom right to devise and help promote a different kind of survey aimed at nighthawks and other night jars in particular, which basically means surveying at night. Her name is Ellie Knight, which is appropriate, and she's a PhD student at the University of Alberta. So what she's helped organize, uh, and it's now spread to parts of Eastern Canada, are a whole bunch of survey routes, exactly the same as the breeding bird surveys, but done after sunset, to which is the best time to detect nighthawks. And we found that a whole lot more occur than if you survey first thing in the morning when most bird biologists are out and active. It also prompted a whole bunch of us to get together for a, a sort of an impromptu meeting uh, at the University of Regina's field station in the Cypress Hills. So these folks all had vested interests in nighthawks from Western North America, and we got together and talked about some of the things we should be doing to find out more about them. Now, as a result of that, some work has been done by a person named Gretchen Newberry in South Dakota, um, looking at, at nighthawks nesting on gravel roofs something that in cities in North America actually became very common beginning probably in the 1940s when gravel roof construction became very very common. It's not used very often anymore and the number of gravel roofs are declining and it's my perhaps unpopular opinion that we artificially provided a whole lot of habitat for nighthawks to nest and now we're taking it away from them and what that's led to is in urban areas people don't see nighthawks nearly as often as they used to and thus the perception correct that the numbers are not nearly as high but I'm of the opinion that we probably increase those numbers artificially and we are not weren't looking for nighthawks in the right place. To the rescue, in part, comes Andrea Seidler, who's from the Yukon. And she set out to do her master's um, with me at the university, looking at nighthawk numbers in the Yukon, specifically with respect to um, the age of forests that she surveyed. So all the little gray triangles on the map represent the locations where she did extensive surveys using Ellie's protocol um, to see how many nighthawks were there. And she also quantified how old the forest was in the location where she surveyed. So on the bottom axis is forest age in years. So zero means 
right after a forest fire. That's when forests are zero age old, up to 60 plus years. And the take home message from the graph is that nighthawks were much more common in forests that were very young in age. They were found throughout, and she actually found nighthawks on 19 out of her 20 survey routes. So she detected them very commonly, but young forests tend to have more. And if you do some statistical uh, wizardry, what she shows is that your probability of detecting a nighthawk on a survey route is hugely higher when the forest is young as opposed to when the forest is old. So this gives the hint that for nighthawks, forest fires are really important because they like bare ground. That's where they nest, that's where they usually roost, and you get much less bare ground as forests get old. I also reiterate that she found nighthawks on 19 of her 20 survey routes, which were designed um, to look for these birds in forests of all of these ages. The other cool thing that she did um, is she used these little acoustic detectors. So um, they've actually also been used by bat biologists, which you can leave out and they record for weeks at a time. And so this, these are data for three very, very separated sites, separated by hundreds of kilometers in the Yukon, beginning about the 1st of June, going to sort of the mid to late August. And you'll notice that on every single night, she detected nighthawks at, with these recorders. And in some cases, 200 plus calls on a given night, which means there were lots of nighthawks around these detectors. So the take home message from Andrea's work is that forest age is important, but also in the Yukon, there are lots of nighthawks. Then I introduce you to Gabe Foley, another master's student in my lab, who did a similar kind of project to Andrea, only this time in northwestern Ontario, about 700 kilometers north of Thunder Bay, is a, a gold mine that's known as the Muscle White Mine. Our attention was first drawn to this um, by some colleagues with Environment Canada, who noted that in 2011, there was a huge fire, sort of about 50 kilometers by 30 kilometers that occurred around this mine. So the mine is the big black dot towards the top of the map. The black is a road that goes to the mine. And what Gabe did is a whole lot of sampling along that road inside where the fire was and outside what, where the fire wasn't to see if there was a difference in how nighthawks used these habitats. And what he found, sort of like Andrea, is that the number of nighthawks declined with distance from the unburned forest edge. Now, you'll note that, like Andrea, he found nighthawks in most of his sampling areas. There was just a whole lot more in areas that were close to where the forest fire was uh, or within where the forest fire was. So he did a similar set of statistical wizardry. And again, nighthawk abundance seems to be very much a function of, in this case, not so much forest age did he use, but canopy cover. Older forests have higher canopy cover, so the same sort of relationship. Like Andrea, he found this location was literally dripping with nighthawks. These birds were everywhere. They were certainly very common. So it leads to the idea that while for people, this is a devastating site and something we're very afraid of and think of as really, really bad, for these birds and many nightjar species, fire seems to be incredibly important because it gets rid of canopy, it gets rid of forest, and it creates lots of bare ground, which is what they thrive on. So as a result, in part, some of our work, but in part due to Ellie's new survey design and new data, in 2018, Kosiwik sort of changed its designation for nighthawks from threatened to special concern, which means we still have to worry about them a little bit, but it's not nearly as bad as being threatened. So 
We've now learned that in the boreal forest region of Canada, these birds seem to be doing very, very well indeed, and especially in areas where there is fire. So I sort of want to suggest that forest fires for some things actually are good things, not bad things. Final piece of cool trivia about uh, common nighthawks uh, comes from work done by Ellie and a former student of mine, uh, Janet Ng. They put on GPS trackers to nighthawks that were caught in the area of Fort McMurray in Alberta. These allowed them to track the migratory paths of these birds over the winter. So I think this is from five or six different individuals. Each color represented, represents a different individual. And this is all um, where they went in the winter on the left-hand side and where they went back to those places in the springtime. So it's neat. They seem to return to the place that they nested and reproduced the year before. And they were all going to Brazil for the winter. Now, this is kind of depressing what I'm going to show you, but the left hand set of panels with the dots show where three different individuals spent their time roosting during the winter in Brazil. And it suggests that in all cases, they were in forest in Brazil. But if you look at the right hand panel, in that instance, the picture is zoomed out. And you realize that the forest in all three cases is a tiny little patch surrounded by huge clear cuts. Um, and the birds didn't use nearby areas with large tracts of contiguous forest or uncut forest. So they seem to like bits of forest that are left over after most of the other stuff is cut down. Uh, kind of sort of, I don't want to promote deforestation in the Amazon, but again, these birds like seem to like disturbance. So I would say that we have to look at these kinds of landscapes in perhaps a slightly different way from the perspective of these birds that I know and love. So what about grasslands? Well, nighthawks seem to be reasonably common in grasslands areas of North America, although they depend on area that isn't uh, covered in grass. And how does that happen? Well, fire is a good way for that to happen, or not necessarily suggesting that this is the best thing, heavy duty grazing where you get rid of most of the grass. You won't find nighthawks in areas where there's thick high grass. They need more or less bare ground, um, but they do occur um, quite commonly in areas where that bare ground exists. So grassland areas of Western Canada and the Northern United States are pretty good for common nighthawks. So, take home message from a whole lot of words that I've said tonight is that these are two very, very cool groups of animals. They share a lot of things in common, particularly the way they deal with cold, the ability to hibernate and use torpor, um, the fact that they feed on nocturnal insects, um, and that we really don't know a whole lot about them. So as Halloween approaches, please remember that my friends, the bats, aren't horrid. They're not out to suck your blood. They're not going to fly in your hair, and they're not really dangerous at all. And I hope I've given you a bit more of an appreciation for these things that we call goat suckers, and you don't have to hide your livestock and worry about them. Um, they're going to eat your bugs. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions, and I thank those of you who've taken the time to listen to me. Thank you so much. That was such an interesting presentation. I know I learned a ton. I, ne I never knew why they were called night jars before. So <laughs> thank you very much, Mike. Um, I see we have a couple questions here from some listeners. Um, and to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions, just feel free to type it in. Um, so there's a listener named Derek that would like to know, uh, first off, where on the evolutionary tree do bats fall? Um, basically, what other mammals are they closely related to? So this has changed in the past few years, um, but their closest relatives amongst the mammals would be the carnivores, grizzly bears. They're also probably fairly re closely related to uh, insectivores like shrews. 
but we know for sure, uh, and I should also say they're reasonably closely related to us, primates. Um, their most distant relatives would be the rodents. So rodents, mice, rats, all those sorts of things tend to live fast, die young, and reproduce in huge numbers. So that's why mice are so difficult to deal with if they're in your house, is that they can have litters of four or five, they can have litters every six to weeks to two months, um, but at, they're lucky they live to be a year old. Most bats have a single pup once per year, and some species can live to be 45 or 50 years old. So in that sense, they're a lot like us. They reproduce slowly and they die very at old ages, not young ages. Thank you. Uh, listener named Alicia would like to know, could you talk a little more about the issues facing bats currently, such as white nose syndrome, anthropogenic caused issues, and that sort of thing? Sure. So there are two major, I mean, besides the problem of, of habitat destruction and active uh, persecution, which causes bats some problems, and in some parts of the world, they're considered a delicacy, so they're hunted and eaten. But in North America, the two principal relatively recent threats to them are um, uh, a disease called white nose syndrome uh, and uh, wind energy installations, giant turbines. Now, let me deal with the turbines first. They deal or, or they are most destructive to migratory species of bats, not the hibernating ones, but migrating ones. The three in particular in Canada are called the hoary bat, the silver haired bat, and the red bat. And they get killed at these turbines quite frequently and the hoary bat is probably going to get Kasiwik status relatively soon. I'm a big fan of wind energy and I think it's really really good and this is a problem that I think with biologists help we can solve. Um, most of the uh, mortality occurs in the fall when the bats are migrating south um, in the first hour, hour and a half of evening. And it would appear that bats are actually attracted to these turbines and get whacked by the spinning blades. So I think with uh, uh, wind energy companies, we can mitigate such that we can reduce the vast majority of the fatalities and have the really good stuff that wind power produces and reduce the number of bats that are getting killed. So um, we can have both in this case. It's going to take some work and some time, but we can have both. White nose syndrome is a fungal disease that was imported by accident uh, from Europe to a cave near Albany, New York, where thousands of little brown bats hibernated. And it grows on bats and it basically interferes with hibernation. It makes them lose water much faster than they should and they have to wake up and try to rehydrate. Many of them die due to lack of water over the winter or leave hibernation in such horrible condition that they're not able to survive. The most recent estimate I've read suggests somewhere between six and 10 million bats have died due to this disease. I suspect it is in Saskatchewan. No records for sure show that, but it's certainly in Manitoba, it's in Minnesota, it's been recorded from British Columbia, and most big hibernation sites in eastern North America don't have many bats at all in them anymore. Now, it's interesting that it affects bats differently. So currently in Canada, um, the little brown bat, which was formerly the most common species in North America, the northern long-eared bat, uh, and a bat called the tricolored bat seem to be most affected and their numbers have plummeted in many places. So those species are now considered endangered in Canada because of white nose syndrome. We have some evidence to suggest that they, some individuals are able to survive it and are starting to do better in the places where white nose syndrome has occurred. But remember, these animals re reproduce very, very slowly. So it's going to take hundreds of years for recovery to happen, if it ever does. Um, and so therefore, the community of bats that we have in much of North America is just going to change and be very different. And we're going to have many fewer. I don't think there is anything specific that we're going to be able to do specifically to stop it. We might be able to slow it down 
Biologists have, uh, take much greater care now to make sure we don't spread the fungus. Um, and I do think we'll slow it down, but it's here. It's not going away. We're not going to get rid of it. Um, and there's going to be a community change that happens as a result of it. Thanks for that answer. Um, a listener named Sarah would like to know, or says, it's encouraging to hear that nitrogen may be able to cope with changing habitat, human disturbance, and rising temperatures. However, it is concerning that the recent report on the state of Canada's birds show that aerial insectivores are down by almost 60% since 1970. And she's wondering if there's any research to be done to address other causes of declines for night jars, such as possible trophic mismatch due to climate change. Uh, there hasn't been, but it's certain an area that, that we need to do some more work on. Um, and I guess with the very limited information that we have and, and my knowledge of a number of sites for nighthawks in particular, um, I would argue that so far they don't appear to be really being affected um, in the same way that swifts and swallows and all those other birds are. There's evidence that whippoorwills are certainly declining in eastern North America. And there's been all sorts of ideas proposed as to why this might be happening. One of them is simply that the number of nocturnal insects is declining due to climate change or other factors. That seems to me to be quite a reasonable idea, but the actual evidence for it, in my opinion, um, needs to be strengthened some before we can really say that that's the case. Why nighthawks, in my view, seem to still be doing really quite well is a mystery. It's a mystery that I, I'm keen to try to understand, but I, I'm happy that it, at least in their case, seems to be a positive story as opposed to a negative one. Um, I guess the first place I studied nighthawks was in the southern part of the Okanagan Valley, a little bit south of Penticton, British Columbia. There's a particular site there along a river where on a nightly basis in the summer, you get three to 400 of these birds congregating over a stretch of river about 50 to 75 meters long, 30 meters wide, and that congregation has not changed since the early 1980s. There's every bit as many birds there now as there was when I first started studying them. And I take that to be good news, although hopefully it's not sucking birds in from a great big area and all those other places are not doing well. But likewise, other places that I've visited and know of do seem to still be supporting healthy nighthawk populations. Um, Mark, this is just a question that I have. Um, what what do you think is the future for nighthawks? Like the, it seems that the population is doing well. Um, Coast Week has uh, downlisted it. So, what do you see in the future for for common nighthawks? This may not be popular, but here's my guess. I think over the next, assuming that there's enough insects to eat, and and I, I that is an assumption. But over the next 50 odd years with climate change, and given the fact that we have prevented forest fires from happening in many places, we are going to have a whole lot more forest fires in the boreal forest of western North America. Those fires are going to lead to much more habitat for nighthawks, and I submit that their populations are going to increase over the next 50 years or so, um, simply because there's no way we're going to be able to stop all those fires, and fire is going to become much more prevalent with more uh, extreme events, electrical storms, um, and all the fuel loads that are on the ground since we've stopped fire so, so long. So I think they're actually going to do very well. Hmm, that's great. Um, one of our listeners, Morgan, would like to know, is there a correlation between common nighthawks in young forests and tree cavity snags? Uh, never actually evaluated whether there is, but I wouldn't expect there to be because they just don't use holes in trees ever. They would never go into a tree cavity, um, but in those young cavities from dead trees after fires probably support quite a few insects and those would be the kinds of insects that these birds would be eating. So it's not the cavities in trees that are important, it's the bare ground and the bare branches that they're probably using um, which are important. Thank you for that answer. Um, a listener named Jeff Holroyd would like to know, or he actually says he disagrees with your comments on like hawk decline. 
And he says that the BBS routes are primarily south of the Boreal Forest. Uh, BBS actually starts 30 minutes before dawn and does catch the end of the, feed, the dawn feeding time, um, with 80% of the prairies cultivated and BBS on um, that's breed, bird breeding surveys on the prairies showing declines. Nighthawks are not doing well in Prairie Canada. Do you think that Coastwick should show two status designations for Nighthawks with more concern in the South? He makes a very good point. I guess it's just a little bit more complicated than I wanted to try to get across to the audience. They don't use cropland very much, if at all, so he's absolutely right. He's absolutely right that the breeding bird survey does overlap a little bit with the time that nighthawks are active. He's absolutely right that there are very few breeding bird survey routes in boreal forest and people hadn't studied them there before. All of those things are perfectly correct. However, when we use a more targeted survey, even in the southern part of the province, the number of birds that we turn up is much greater than the breeding bird survey does. So I don't want to paint as bleak a picture as perhaps it might. And finally, I would say I served on Kasiwik for a number of years. And the only way that they designate differences um, between regions is if there are distinct genetic differences or reasons to suggest they're in different and very distinct populations. And we don't have any idea or any evidence that that exists for these birds. So right now, we don't have the information to say whether it's true. And therefore, what Kasiwik does is if you don't have that information, then you don't use that strategy. Um, I, I wanted to paint a positive picture that when we've looked for them in the boreal forest, there are lots and lots and lots. Awesome. Thanks for that answer. Um, it looks like we have one last question here. A listener named Sarah, Sarah um, says that she has experience handling common night hawks with foul droppings, and she's wondering if night jars have a TCM or dropping as galliforms do, part of my presentation. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to get at you, but I'm not sure. Can you just read that one again? Um, she said she has experience handling common nighthawks with foul droppings, and she's wondering if night jars have a casium or cacol droppings as galliforms do. Okay. Um, nighthawks feces does stink. There's no doubt about it. It's very rude smelling and uh, um, unpleasant. To be very honest, I don't know what causes that. However, other night jars don't have that. So if a poor will poops in your hand, it, it's not uh, unpleasant at all. It has very little odor. Um, but nighthawks, and there are sort of half a dozen or eight species of, of nighthawks, the common one is the only one that gets to Canada. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, all of them have the the smelly poop, um, and all night jars that I've handled don't. So, But the reason, to the best of my knowledge, hasn't been investigated, or if it has, I'm just not aware of the results. Thank you. Thanks for that answer. I, that looks like all the questions that we have today, and a few of them have written in to say thank you for the presentation. Uh, so with that, I just want to sincerely thank you for the awesome and varied presentation of all the topics and species that you've covered today. It's been really informative, so thank you very much for your time this evening. My and great pleasure. Thank, thanks to all of our listeners out there for uh, tuning in and catching our broadcast. Um, when you leave a broadcast, there'll be a quick uh, one-minute survey that'll pop up. If you don't mind filling that out, we really appreciate it. Then we can report back to our funders and keep our Native Prairie Speaker Series going into the future. So with that, thank you very much, everyone, and have a great Halloween. <laughs>